Gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here today and, take, and to take part in this joint initiative of four institutions devoted to the topic of managing financial crisis. The extensive program over the next two days will ena enable uh, policymakers and academics to engage in a frank exchange of views about policy responses to financial crisis and a thorough reflection on crisis management from different angles. The global financial crisis erupted more than 10 years ago and triggered a lengthy process of transformation for central banks and supervisory authorities. The G20 summits in 2009 sent in motion the global efforts to strengthen our institutional framework by creating more effective oversight of key financial players, products and markets. In Europe, we have seen the establishment of the European Systemic Risk Board in 2010, with the power to issue warnings and recommendations, the SSM in 2014, and the Single Resolution Mechanism in 2015, one year later, with formal supervisory and resolution competences at the European level. The sheer number of institutions involved in financial stability raises the question of governance. Today, I would like to address the question of what role central banks play in safeguarding financial stability. This conference addresses the question from the specific perspective of crisis management. I would like to take uh, a step back and cover the broader institutional setup, and in particular the role of central banks. I will focus on the interplay between monetary policy, banking supervision, and macroprudential policy and elaborate on how central banks fit into this trilogy of public policy responsibilities. I will first discuss how the responsibility for financial stability is shared among many authorities and the prominent role played by central banks. I will then address the very specific relevance of financial stability for central banks and the toolkit to safeguard it. I will look at the setup within the Economic and Monetary Union and how recent changes in the European institutional setup can further enhance financial stability. Finally, I will say a few words about a very topical issue related to the financial system resilience, the results of the recent stress test that was just published last Friday. Today's financial system builds on the interaction between many specialized financial institutions. While banks remain at the heart of financial intermediation, insurance companies, pension funds, and asset management companies, including investment and hedge funds, play an increasingly important role. All these financial intermediaries face and manage risks, resulting in a financial system which faces systemic risk from multiple sources. To account for these multiple dimensions, the ECB relates financial stability to the stability of core functions provided by the financial system, and ultimately to economic growth. Supporting and ensuring the provision of these core functions is the role of public policy. The polyedric, the polyedric nature of systemic risk requires the involvement of multiple policy areas to ensure financial stability across the entire system. The responsibility for safeguarding financial stability is held by three interrelated policy areas. First, microprudential supervision is tasked with ensuring the stability of individual financial institutions. Second, macroprudential policy responsible for ensuring the stability of the banking and financial system as a whole across individual institutions and over time. Third, and finally, in times of crisis, monetary policy provides liquidity to the financial system as lender of last resort. In normal times, price stability contributes to promote financial stability. The reason why three policy areas now involved in financial stability is clear. The great financial crisis taught us that microprudential supervision alone cannot safeguard the stability of the banking system as a whole. It focuses on the stability of individual institutions and does not sufficiently account for the systemic aspect of financial stability created by amplification and contagion mechanisms. For its part, monetary policy cannot sufficiently contain the costs 
of a financial crisis once it erupts. To prevent such situations, academics and commentators have often invoked the need for monetary policy to lean against financial imbalances. But this could imply a deviation from its price stability mandate, at least in the short run. Monetary policy is able to get into all the cracks of the financial system, but it is too blunt a tool to address specific risks and imbalances and could be likely to generate large macroeconomic costs. Instead, additional preemptive policies need to be called upon. Macroprudential policy is forward-looking and preemptive with a clear focus on financial stability. Its objective is to prevent and mitigate systemic risk by strengthening the resilience of the financial system and by smoothing the financial cycle. The question is then how can the institutional architecture be set up to ensure financial stability by building on the respective responsibilities of supervisory, macroprudential and monetary policy. Central banks have always had a keen interest in financial stability, irrespectively of uh, their concrete mandates. Historically, one reason for setting up a central bank was to reduce bank panics through the lender of last resort function. In today's world, a central banker's interest in financial stability goes far beyond the mere lender of last resort function. Indeed, financial stability is a precondition for monetary policy to achieve its price stability objective. Monetary policy impulses cannot transmit to the real economy without a stable and well-functioning banking system. At the heart of, complementary between, uh, of the complementary between price and financial stability is the shared responsibility of central banks and commercial banks for money creation. Central banks have the monopoly for creating outside money, whereas commercial banks provide inside money to facilitate transactions and to finance the broader economy. The shared responsibility between central banks and commercial banks in this process implies that the value of money relies not just on the provision of outside money by central banks, but also on the overall credit worthiness of commercial banks. A stable financial environment ensures that money created by commercial banks remains fully fun fungible with central bank money across all parts of the financial system. A stable banking system is a precondition for any central bank to achieve its main mandate of safeguarding the stability of its currency. It is thus only natural that a central bank holds financial stability responsibilities in addition to those it has for monetary stability. Traditionally, the two, the, the two central bank instruments that interact with financial stability have been the monetary policy rate and crisis management instruments. As I already mentioned, the monetary policy rate is, in most cases, to plant a tool to address the build-up of financial imbalances. Emergency liquidity assistance, on the other hand, is a crucial tool for central banks in times of crisis, enabling them to ensure that payment and settlement systems remain operational. Deploying it effectively requires detailed information on market conditions and market infrastructures, as well as supervisory information on individual financial institutions. Beyond crisis management, ensuring stable conditions requires a stronger regulation and sounder supervisory practices. It also involves preemptive macroprudential policies that limit the build-up of imbalances and increase resilience ahead of future stressed events. These preemptive macroprudential instruments can steer market participants towards man maintaining conditions that do not endanger financial stability. The question that frequently arises is whether banking supervision and macroprudential policy should become explicit responsibilities of central banks. The various frameworks in place around the world cover a wide range of institutional arrangements. But irrespectively of the specific institutional setup, all arrangements assign a significant role to central banks in safeguarding financial stability. The reasons for this are straightforward in my view. First, monetary policy and macroprudential policy can be seen as strategic complements. 
in addressing risks from financial uh, imbalances, particularly resulting from asset price overvaluations. More active macroprudential policy allows monetary policy stance to remain accommodative and support a macroeconomic recovery in line with price stability. This strategic interaction requires cooperation between both sets of policymakers, which is more efficiently achieved within one institution while observing the necessary and appropriate Chinese walls. One of the main reservations about allocating banking supervision and macroprudential decision making to central banks stems from the concern about the interaction and possi possible trade-offs between the financial stability and the price stability objectives. In the case of the ECB, the scope for trade-offs is clearly contained as the primary objective of the ECB continues to be price stability. And I would argue that there is merit in assigning responsibility for decisions in all three policy areas at the central bank, given that price and financial stability reinforce each other. Most importantly, it ensures that decisions are consistent across policy areas. Spillovers from one policy area can be taken into account in an effective manner, while duly observing separation rules governing, governing the policy domains. Second, central banks have a deep knowledge about the functioning of financial markets. They continuously monitor financial conditions to identify vulnerabilities and threats to financial stability, and their assessment is backed up by broad-based market intelligence and the authority to request relevant data from financial market participants. Adding banking supervision, and in particular, macroprudential policy to the central bank's tasks shifts the emphasis more strongly towards preventive policies. Macroprudential policy can address financial stability risks in the specific areas where they, they arise, be it at the level of a country, a sector, or a financial institution. It can also effectively free monetary policy from the temptation to counter financial imbalances when systemic, systemic risks increase. This reduces the apparent need for leaning. At the same time, macroprudential policy reduces the likelihood and the severity of downturns should risks materialize. With these conceptual considerations in mind, let me now examine the specific responsibilities of the ECB, starting with its legal mandate. The ECB's financial stability mandate is based on Article 127 of the treaty and comes in addition to its primary objective of price stability. It involves several duties. Firstly, the treaty requires the ECB to contribute to the smooth conduct of policies pursued by competent authorities relating to the prudential supervision of credit institutions and the stability of the financial system. Second, it gives the ECB a consultative and advisory role in the rulemaking process. Third, it assigns the ECB the task of promoting the smooth operation of payment systems. In addition, since November 2014, the SSM regulation allocates supervisory powers and a clear role for macroprudential policy to the ECB. The SSM regulation reflects the decision to allocate microprudential micro supervision and macroprudential policy responsibilities to the ECB, while building as much as possible on national expertise and structures. This implies that for countries in the euro area, the Governing Council is the ultimate decision maker on matters of monetary policy, macroprudential policy, and microprudential banking supervision. This institutional arrangement overcomes the double separation of policies along the geographical and functional dimension. Monetary policy operated at the level of the euro area and banking supervision at the level of member states. This left a gap requiring close and smooth cooperation and coordination. The drafters of the treaty have clearly identified that potential problems might arise from this separation. They therefore explicitly allowed for the powers of the ECB to be amended with a simplified procedure should the interaction between area-wide monetary policy and national supervisory powers need to be strengthened to effectively, effectively safeguard financial stability. This simplified procedure is established in Article 127 and it states that the European Council can confer specific tasks upon the European Central Bank concerning policies relating to the prudential supervision of credit institutions and other financial institutions. 
The great financial crisis evidenced the need for a more integrated approach while assigning different instruments to the respective objectives of price and financial stability. With the launch, with the launch of uh, the European Banking Supervision in 2014, the ECB became the microprudential supervisor of the euro area, and macroprudential policies became the shared responsibility of the national competent authorities and the ECB. National authorities, with the, their detailed knowledge of the domestic banking system and financial structures, are well placed to assess financial stability risks. This goes hand in hand with the responsibility to address financial imbalances and to counter systemic risks using the available instruments. The ECB, with its cross-country perspective, complements the national authorities' responsibilities and can, if deemed necessary, instead of the national authorities, apply higher capital buffer requirements and more stringent measures than those adopted by the national authorities to address systemic or macroprudential risks at the level of credit institutions. Such macroprudential measures have been applied to more than 100 systemically relevant banks in the form of systemic institution buffers, systemic risk buffers, or the counter-cyclical capital buffer for exposures to entire countries. The aim of establishing the banking union with a single supervisor is to enable banks in the euro area to operate under the same conditions regardless of their location. This could increase the soundness of individual banks and foster financial integration with capital and liquidity flowing freely across borders. While huge, while huge progress has been achieved, the banking union is unfortunately not yet complete. A European deposit insurance scheme is still missing. Such a risk-sharing arrangement could lead, could lead to further risk reduction and support financial stability. All in all, central banks have demonstrated that they can be effective, effective crisis managers in times of stress. But they have often lacked the toolkit to preemptively address financial stability risks while they are building up. Preemptive uh, macroprudential policy is essential in any economy to complement an onboard monetary policy. Its instruments can tame the financial cycle when imbalances build up and can ensure that uh, the appropriate level of resilience to absorb losses should risks materialize. This is all the more important in a monetary union, where economic and financial conditions across member countries can differ significantly. I have argued that an effective institutional setup involves ensuring consistent decision decisions across the micro, the micro prudential, macro prudential, and monetary policy areas, reflecting the economic rationale. The ECB has legal responsibilities in all three areas in accordance with the treaty and the SSM regulation. Before closing, allow me to deviate from financial stability frameworks to look at the related topic of the resilience of the financial system and to focus on the resilience of the euro area banking system today. Last Friday, as you know, the European Banking Authority published the results of the stress test. For the 33 euro area significant institutions that took part in the EVA exercise, the average final common equity tier one capital, the core capital, after a stress, it stood at 9.9%, up from 8.8% in the 2016 exercise. In terms of capital depletion, the 2018 stress test resulted in an adverse scenario reduction of average core capital of 3.8 percentage points, up from 3.3 percentage points in 2016. I would like to highlight two main points underlying these results. First, the improved strength of euro area banks is due to the strong buildup of capital buffers in recent years. The average capital ratio going into the stress test stood at 13.7%, up from 12.2% in uh, 2016, two years ago. At the same time, banks entered the exercise in better condition than before, owing to overall improved economic conditions and their continued efforts to reduce legacy assets. Second, compared with 2016, the adverse scenario in the 2018 stress test was generally more severe for European economies along several dimensions, such as GDP growth, property prices, and equity prices. 
The, ad the adverse scenario focused on the repricing of global risk previa, adverse fe feedback loops between low growth and weak, and weak bank profitability, and private and public debt sustainability concerns. The challenge of the 2018 scenario was that the cutoff point, the cutoff date, was unusually early, and so the scenario does not account for more recent events, in particular developments in emerging markets and sovereign spreads. The overall high level of resilience achieved by the euro area banking system should not hide the fact that areas of vulnerability remain. To briefly characterize the summary results, I would group the banks into three broad categories depending on their final core capital ratio in the adverse scenario. Clearly, I am using indicative benchmarks rather than formal thresholds. This is important to bear in mind. First, banks with stressed core capital ratios above 11% clearly reflect strong capital positions and comfortable capacity to withstand shocks. These are nine banks in this group. There are nine banks in this group representing 15% of total assets of the euro area banking sector. In the second category, 12 banks had core capital ratios between 9 and 11%, representing about 45% of total assets. These banks displayed a reasonable degree of resilience overall. However, some of these banks still have work to do to enhance capitalization and reduce their vulnerability to stress. And finally, banks with core capital ratios in the adverse scenario below 9%. They display a weaker, though still satisfactory, capital position. These two 12 entities, representing almost 40% of total assets, should increase robustness and enhance capital positions to face challenges ahead and will, therefore, be closely monitored. In summary, the overall, the overall resilience of the banks supervised by the ECB has increased compared with the stress test conducted two years ago. That's clear. Banks start from a better capital position. Capital depletion in, in, in 2016, uh, in the 2016 and the present exercise stand at similar levels. Risks and vulnerabilities identified across some institutions, business models, and constituencies, however, require close monitoring. Furthermore, the analysis of aggregate results and the interaction with the real economy, going beyond supervisory ratios, confirms that macroprudential preemptive policy has a very important role to play in safeguarding the stability of the whole system. Thank you very much.